And welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp, and I'm the executive editor for Dataversity. We would like to thank you for joining this month's installment of the monthly Dataversity and DEMA International Webinar Series, Enterprise Data World. This webinar series is designed to give our Enterprise Data World conference attendees education year-round. We are excited to have just open registration and to announce the agenda for EDW 2015 to be held in Washington, D.C., March 29th through April 3rd. So be sure to check it out and take advantage of all the early bird discounts available to you. And today's webinar, webinar is being presented by longtime well-known EDW speaker, Joy Medved. Today she'll be discussing data governance, the four critical success factors. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Or if you like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag EDW. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me formally introduce today's speaker. Joy has been spent most of the past 20 years as a business improvement consultant, strategist, coach, researcher, trainer, and speaker. Her areas of expertise include data governance, data quality, metadata, change management, and process information. She is a certified Six Sigma black belt and an information quality certified professional and always seeks to employ the most efficient and effective combination of methodologies and tools in order to help her clients simplify the quest for quality. And with that, I will turn over the presentation to Joy to get us started. Hello and welcome. Thank you for that lovely introduction. I hope everybody had a great weekend and good morning, good afternoon, good evening. And if you happen to be joining us in the middle of the night, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. Um, as Shannon said, we're going to be discussing data governance, the four critical success factors. And uh, she already kind of gave a little bit of an overview, so I'm not going to go into detail on my background here. I do want to ask that if you have any questions, go ahead and post to the Q&A session. And if we can get to your question while we are actually on the slides, we will try to. Otherwise, we'll try to uh, get to those slides at the end of the presentation. I'll try to leave some time for that. <clears throat> Excuse me. So if you happen to be on Twitter, feel free to tweet, hashtag um, Dataversity, and Shannon, was there another hashtag? Or EDW? Or... Okay, I think, uh, I think uh, hashtag Dataversity will probably work for most people. Yes, sorry, Joy, I was trying to unmute myself there. <laughs> sorry. It also works. <laughs> Wasn't expecting me to ask you a question. Sorry about that. Um, okay, so for today's agenda, I'm going to really quickly just go over what is meant by um, data governance, just to make sure that we're all on the same page. And then we're going to get into discussing the common barriers to building and sustaining data governance. And this, this is critical to dovetail into what the four critical success data governance factors are. Um, and then, <clears throat> excuse me, then we will wrap up with some key elements for successful data governance. Okay. Just to start off, what do we mean by data governance? Well, definition found by DEMA that's in their in literature. And as you can see, data governance really has to do with the planning, monitoring, and enforcement of data governance. Um, and it has to do with with conformance with policy. So it's not so much, here's how we're going to do business, it's here's what we need to do within our business processes in order to make sure that we are conforming with policies that have been developed to ensure uh, security, to ensure data quality, to ensure that our development methods are uh, within compliance, uh, et cetera. So I'm not going to go into, into great detail with that. I just wanted to share that one um, definition with you, as well as this definition, which I also love from the Data Governance Institute, Gwen Thomas, and she adds that it's a system of decision rights and accountability. And this is really important, the steward, whole stewardship piece that goes along with data governance that defines who can decide what, when, under what circumstances. These are all the things that governance puts into play. So really, data governance does encompass that word governance. It's, it's the, the how and what we need to do in order to ensure our business requirements are not only accurate but adhered to and can make the business as successful as possible. 
Okay. So, well, if that's data governance, then what is data management? And I threw this in because I do get a lot of questions from clients about, well, well, then what is data management? How does that differ from us? And data management, on the other hand, is really has to do with managing required data. So it has to do with moving the data through the system, how it's acquired, how it's validated, how it's stored, um, how it's protected, how it's processed, et cetera. Now, there's a lot of overlap, and I'm not going to get into all the details because I just want to breeze through this really quick, but um, they really are different things. So if you're confused at all about the difference between any of these items, data quality, data governance, data management, metadata, et cetera, there are a lot of um, resources online to help to help with that. Or feel free to give me a call and I can, I'll be happy to discuss the, uh, the topics with you as well. So one other thing I want to talk, want to talk about real quick before we get into the meet is doing a project and a program. Oftentimes I get asked, well, is data governance a project? Is it a program? What, what is data governance? So a project is really something that's short term. Data governance on the other hand is really not a short term one-off program. Data governance is very horizontal in the company. Data governance is an ongoing system that basically helps you define how you're going to run the business from, from a governance standpoint. And so a project, while it will include governance, absolutely, governance is itself not a project. It is usually a combination of projects that get lumped together and it's, it's a whole series of things that go on. Sometimes programs are ongoing, sometimes they're fine. It really depends. I've, I've seen lots of different um, ways that companies handle uh, programs. I've, I've seen, uh, had one client that said they absolutely have zero programs whatsoever. Every single thing they do is a project. Um, and while that does have some problems, um, that gives you an idea that there, there really is no one way that, that companies manage out there. Programs are different from projects in that they're ongoing. They're usually, they're, well, sometimes they're ongoing, sometimes they're finite, but they're usually a combination of a whole bunch of different little projects that get managed in there. And then you have business as usual. And BAU is something that you really want to strive for with data governance. If you can get data governance not just built and managed, but infused into your company culture such that it is ongoing, it is a normal day-to-day -day routine, then it doesn't seem like something that's extra thrown on on top of somebody's job where they have to do all this extra work because that, that then creates negativity and a lot, of, a lot of bad things. So business as usual, I find that the companies out there that are most successful and successful with data governance have built their data governance such that it becomes business as usual within that company and everybody's involved with it. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Here real quick, I just wanted to show up, show you what a, a data governance framework looks like. And this again is, is a DEMA framework. There are other frameworks out there. But as you can see, data governance is in the middle and all the pieces and parts are around the outside and everything intermingles, everything is inter interconnected. So you can see that data quality management, for example, data development, these things are their own entities and connect with data governance. So they're, they're definitely not, you know, the same thing. All these things are defined uh, within this book by, by DEMA. If you want to look into a lot more detail about this framework, that is an awesome book to have. Okay, now that we understand what, hopefully, what data governance is and is not, let's move on to the meat. Uh, common barriers to building and sustaining data governance. So why do many data governance strategies struggle? This is a really great question. Over the years, I've been working with data governance efforts um, with companies for about 10 years. I became a Six Sigma Black Belt in 2004, and that's when I started doing a whole lot more process improvement within data quality, data warehousing, and sort of slipped right into the data governance work as it started becoming more and more popular with companies. And over the years, I've sort of collected this interesting list of, of things that have happened that I've seen happen on jobs. So what you're going to see now is kind of a combination a brainstorm of all of these things that I've put together. I do, of course, as, as a data geek that I am, I use one of my tools. This is one of my favorite tools, the fishbone. So the fishbone is really great for helping to um, brainstorm and categorize different types of information. 
it's very popular. Lots of you know about, about the fishbone. So I did this with the common barriers. So I organized this into four groups. The first group is lack of focus. And some of the barriers that I've seen that fall to lack of focus have to do with not having things like a charter, a mission, or a vision, not having defined ship roles, not having some sort of standard of change management or communication plans and methodologies in order to educate and inform your staff about how you're doing data governance, what their roles are with data governance, or simply not having data governance policies and procedures for how the company governs things. Um, interestingly, um, I've gone into to several clients and they've said, we don't do data governance, we want to start data governance. And then by the time I, I get, you know, a week or so in, I'm able to actually show them, yes, you do have data governance. It's informal. It may be, uh, it may lack uh, standard, it may kind of haphazard, siloed in different areas, but through necessity, I find that a lot of, of areas will have some kind of governance for itself. Usually, is the, the lacking piece is the connection to up and downstream functional groups. And the problem there is one person or what one group does doesn't always match what is needed downstream. So more about that as well. A second area, oh, okay, sorry that. Um, so when, doing, when I'm doing focus groups, when I'm talking to people, the, this I threw in as an example of some of the things that you will hear. So the common barriers, this one group here, lack of focus, when I go in and I'm doing an assessment, a data governance assessment, I will talk with a number of different people to try to find out not only what their needs are, but what their pro what the barriers are, what they see as the barriers. Well, oftentimes people are not going to say things like, oh, well, we don't have a mission, we don't have a vision, we don't have defined roles. That's not the kind of information that you're going to get from people. Whether you're an internal employee or you're a consultant going into a company trying to figure out what the issues are of a company, um, talking with the people on the front line is, is obviously one way of doing that. So some of the things that you'll hear people say you need to connect the dots for, this is, a, this is an example. So for example, uh, the second bullet down there, no one knows who should be working on that data stuff. No one um, does unless there's a special request. That's the kind of thing that you'll hear from people. So what does that mean? Well, basically if I hear that coming from somebody, that tells me that there's a lack of defined Leadership uh, roles within the company. So, well, first of all, if they call it that data stuff, there's a whole lot more going on that I need to tackle. But if there's no one person, if they can't tell me, yes, when we have this kind of an issue, we go to these people, or there's a, there's a defined hierarchical structure of who handles what type of issues and who makes decisions within data governance, then there's obviously a lack of defined roles and responsibilities and accountabilities, et cetera. So this kind of gives you an idea of of things to listen for so that you can start narrowing in on what barriers there are. Second group is lack of understanding from, from the company itself. So if there is a lack of um, integration, a lack of new hire training, a lack of communication, if the company has not embraced data as a strategic asset, and uh, if there are no data governance measures and metrics, things like that that provide the information to the company, if those things are missing, then you're, you're naturally going to have a lack of understanding. And some things that you'll hear in that category are on this slide. So, for example, um, the second one, this is one of my favorite ones. And this is, this is true. I've actually heard this from multiple clients. We don't need to know about data quality because we don't use data. That's what IT is for. Now, as a, as a data practitioner, that probably sounds to you. And it probably sounds like I made that up, but, but I, in all honesty, I have heard that from many people. Um, oftentimes, people in customer service, sales, um, different areas within the company, they don't see that they actually use data. They say, oh, we, um, you know, I do customer service. I handle complaints. So I work with complaints from customers. Well, all of that information, the customer information, the product information, the service information, the complaint itself, um, the process of where that complaint goes, the, the escalation process, all that stuff falls within data on some level. 
So if, if I hear somebody say that they don't use data or that IT is for, then I know there's a lot of um, misunderstanding, miscommunication, a lot of lack of understanding in the, in the company. Third area is lack of support. And there's there's a, mostly this has to do with lack of, of support from executives and stakeholders. But the way you can see this is it's not, it's not a priority. Um, data, governance, not, data governance isn't seen as horizontal, it's siloed. For example, they might have IT governance, and that's the only governance that they do, and it's run completely internally by IT, and the business has no knowledge um, of what's going on there. Uh, obviously, people in politics, there can be a lot of things that are preventing data governance from moving forward. I've actually seen um, some executives who have personal pet projects within a company sabotage data governance efforts so their own interests can move forward. That's an extreme situation. It doesn't happen um, that often, I hope, um, but that's an example. And lack of compliance enforcement, and that's a, that's a huge one. Um, if you don't have the authority and the responsibility to be able to move forward with data governance, if you don't have that senior executive support in order to enforce the compliance with data governance, then you're really not, not going to be able to move forward at all. That's, it's going to inhibit you. Some of the things, um, for example, we can't or don't feel comfortable telling other managers how to run their groups. Here's something like that with me is that they really don't understand data governance. They probably don't have a data governance council, which actually helps to manage that, that piece of it. Um, and they don't have the executive support because a, a data governance manager really can't go across the entire company horizontally and tell people how to do their jobs so that they can comply to data governance requirements. That's, that's not the data governance manager's job. They are there to help manage governance policies and procedures themselves. They are not the person who physically goes out and enforces compliance. That really needs to come from the top down. If you, do, if you have a manager who keeps saying, well, I keep going around telling everybody they're not complying and nobody will listen to me, and, uh, you know, the vice presidents are never around, I can't get their support, then you obviously have a problem with, with executive support. Um, the executives themselves should be pushing from the top down, not only that data governance is in full force, but that they need to comply and then enforce um, whatever... Um, what is going to happen if they don't do what they're supposed to be doing? So things don't get signed off. Um, you know, if things get signed off, for example, if you have governance in the SDLC process and they, they get signed off, what is being done, then that's also an indication that you don't have executive support. Because so it's we saying, are oh, yes, yeah. you're coming in. So, so how do you keep enforcement lightweight so it's not considered so heavy that folks just end run it? Well, that's a really good question, actually. Um, and <laughs> compliance is, is a whole area in and of itself that we can talk about. But really briefly, if you have executive support and you work in data governance to this as usual within the company, then it, it's not really informant. It's just business as usual. I try to to encourage companies to do is get to the point where you're building data governance into the day-to-day -day routine of your business processes. That way, it's just another step. It's not this big thing that's landed on somebody's desk that says, we're going to enforce, blah, 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 blah. You know, you don't want to come in, you know, with the, the handed Nazi thing going on. Um, so, you know, you can look at any given um, th things like, um, like sign, sign, doing time cards. So if time cards were looked at as this big extra thing that everybody has to do and, and it's a horrible thing and it's not part of their job but they really have to do it and then it's going to be a negative thing. But time, that's not the way time cards are looked at. Everybody just does their time card. So technically, if you know, filling out a time card really is not part of your job description. That's not you hired to fill out a time card. But it's necessary to fill out a time card in order for certain administrative duties to get done by HR. So that's something that the business is asked to do so that another functional area can accomplish their goal so that you can get paid. Well, the same thing with data governance. 
process. If the data governance pieces and parts are built into the business processes so that it's just part of the business, then that's it just part of the business. It's not this big extra thing that people feel like they're being monitored and forced to comply to things. So I, I hope that answered the question. Uh, so much more to it, and I wish I could get to it, but we don't have time in, in this hour. Um, is there any other questions, Shannon? I don't know. Um, nope. I've got to speed up my mute. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay, so let's uh, let's go ahead on to the fourth section to so make sure we don't don't get behind in time here. Um, so the fourth section is lack of resources, and this one is very obvious. You know, lack of funding, lack of time, lack of people, um, lack of skills and experience. So hiring people, but they really don't understand uh, what they're doing, or bringing in a tool, but not hiring somebody who actually knows how to use it. In other words, um, the, the traditional, you know, replace skill with the tool and think that the tool is going to do everything you need, but then not having anybody who actually knows how to run the tool properly or, or do analysis properly. Um, and the big one I like is, is not built into projects and programs. If you, if I go into a company and they have an SDLC process or they have different data, data projects going on and there's no meta the data collected, there's no data quality metrics being assigned, then that pretty much tells me that there is no data governance built into their projects and programs. And one of the things that you want to do as soon as you get established is immediately start building governance into projects and programs. If governance is, can absolutely be done iteratively, it can be done um, slowly at first, but the key is to start getting it into the projects and programs so that it can be seen as a normal part of the SDLC process, a normal part of project management. So that's just another step, like I said. It's not this big thing where they say, in addition to all this work that you're doing, we're going to dump 10 things you've got to do for data governance. And you don't really want to break it out like that. You just want to quite merge it in as another step that they have to do. It can be seen, you know, very uh, unintimidating that way. So uh, this, this one's pretty obvious. Obviously, uh, things like um, lots of wasted time trying to track down metadata resources that end up not existing. Well, if you don't understand how to build a report um, and you don't know, you know, there, there's a, a, a field called Custer, but it's in four different tables and you don't know which table is the correct table and there's metadata to check it against. That's an example of lack of resources. There's a lack of metadata. You're trying to track down the person who knows and they're on maternity leave and nobody else knows. You're going to run around wasting a lot of time and money um, and, and probably have a lot of mistakes in whatever it is you're trying to accomplish. So examples of lack of resource. And keep in mind that these Thing I have just shared with you, there's no particular order or priority to them. They are all equally as important to identify and, and take care of. Um, one of the things that I want to point out here is to identify whether or not the barriers are excuse me, symptoms or causes. If you put a Band-Aid on a bleeding artery, you're really not going to make, make much progress in fixing those barriers. So one of the tools that I, I love to use is called the five whys. And obviously, it is basically what it says. You ask why, you get an answer. You say, well, but why? And you get an answer, you say, but why? And if you ever have a question as to how this tool really works, go talk to a two-year-old. Two-year-olds are, are natural data quality people in my book. A two-year-old will, will absolutely demonstrate the perfect five whys, although I know sometimes they get into like 10, 15, 20 whys, and then you have to kind of get a drink because they're driving you nuts. But um, that, that really is, you know, it's beaten out of us. We naturally want to find the cause of whatever it is we're, we're interested in. And as kids, we're told to stop asking why. I know I was. I would ask why all the time. And I can remember even as a little kid, my, my mother yelling at me to stop asking why. And, of course, I didn't listen, which is why I do what I do today. But um, definitely you want to get to the root cause. And you want to kind of stop at one point where you have a a feasible you can deal with. You want to be able to have the resources, the time, the money, and the people to fix what you can fix. So you have to be realistic about how far down you go. So you definitely want to get to the root causes. You've got to find the root causes before you can fix them. Okay. 
So now let's get on to the common barriers. Uh, I'm sorry. This is a, so this is just a recap of what we just looked at, the common barriers. Now this goes directly into the full success factors. So based on those four categorizations, the four critical success factors are the focused strategy and plan, the company understanding, full top-down support, executive support, stakeholder support, and ongoing funding and resources. So we'll talk about those in a bit more detail here. So the first one is focused strategy and plan. And just like the barriers, it involves having a charter and a mission, having that communication plan, having the defined roles and responsibilities, identifying and articulating what your priorities are. If you don't know what your priorities are, there's no way you can articulate them. I often get, get um, I, I've gone in, matter of fact, last year I had two clients I went into and both of them had, had similar issues. They had started a data governance program a couple years earlier. And when I got there, one of the questions people kept asking me was, what is data governance? What do they do? What does the data governance office really do? Because we don't understand. So if you've had a data governance office for two years, and you still have people saying, what do they do? Then you don't have an articulated priorities or you have a lack of communication about those articulated priorities. The second one is the company understanding. Without training, without required training, this doesn't have to be you know, massive data analytics training for all your staff, but within onboarding training or with in each functional group, depending on the person's role in, in the company, you want to have um, training as to what data governance or data quality or, or whatever is. I did have one company I went into a number of years ago, and I was responsible for developing a series of data quality training. And the company actually did it, did it really, really smartly. Instead of just having a training that was data quality, you know, what is data quality at, at the company? What they do is go around to each functional area and talk to the managers and actually develop a tailored training for that department. So um, this was uh, this was actually an oil company, and so I developed a um, data quality training for geologists. I uh, developed a data governance training for the geospatial. Group um, and so all the examples and the in the data that they were looking at directly related to their job, the data that they use, so they could understand data quality from their point of view. Um, and I thought that was that was a brilliant brilliant way to do it. Um, so the third one is full top down support. Again, you've got that that stakeholder and executive support from the top down. Data governance has to be considered a priority or it's not going to get built into the system. Um, obviously, without top-down executive support, you're not going to have that compliance enforcement capability. One is ongoing funding and resources. Again, very obvious. You want to make sure that you have dated time, dedicated people, ongoing funding, uh, the correct skills and experience necessary. Uh, obviously built into projects. And then your, your automated or other technologies help with data governance, et cetera. Uh, at this point, I want to just stop really quick and ask Shannon if there's any, any questions up to this point. Good. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Um, so on to the key elements for successful data governance. Again, in, in the work that I've done over the years, these are just some things that I've put together in order to help ensure data governance success. And many of the things that I'm going to share with you right now, if, if one or more of these is missing, you're really going to have some, some issues with data governance. You sometimes get away with, with iteratively um, building these things into your program, but if you've got, you know, if there are two major things are missing, you're really going to have problems with uh, with success data governance. And the first one I always tell people is that top-down executive and stakeholder support. Really, with, without that, you're going to have a lot of problems, like the example I used earlier about the data governance manager who is trying to uh, themselves enforce governance across the company. And I have 
I've talked with a number of people who have been put into that situation, and it's very stressful, it's very difficult, and they usually end up being called, you know, the beta Nazi or, you know, the other interesting um, names and people start running when they come down the hall and that's not what you want to do. The data governance manager really needs to be a support and a friend to all of the functional areas across the company to help them with their own governance. So don't want to put your data governance manager into, into that position. And if, if they are, occasionally you can do proof of concept and take the information up and gain top-down support, but um, it's very, very difficult. I just had a conversation a couple weeks ago with somebody who has been trying for five years to get executive support to start data governance. After five years, he said, I, I think they finally are starting to understand. That's a long time to have to have to go without having successful data governance. The second one is a focused charter with clear mission and vision. Um, have had had uh, <laughs> I did have one client recently who said to me, "No, we want a charter. We we don't want to do any of that. We just want data governance." Um, interesting approach, and I I, it, I think it can be done that way. I don't would not recommend it. I think having a charter where you clearly define what the data governance office is going to do, who is going to be involved, what um, depth of scope you're going to tackle. So, for example, you may want to tackle um, master data, or you may want to tackle um, a particular area like marketing data, or you may want to tackle a particular product initially. And so having a charter that says, okay, for enterprise data governance, here's what we're going to do ultimately, but we're going to iteratively over the next three to five years plan to start with these products or these data areas or, or whatever it is that we're going to do. Having that articulated, if somebody comes into the company uh, who's new or if somebody in a company says, you know, I really don't understand what that data governance office does, you hand them the charter and say, no, look, we really do know what we're doing. We've got focus. We've got a mission. You know, we are working on something specific, not just, you know, hanging, collecting money, you know, talking about data all the time. So priorities, actually having identified priorities, which is what I was just saying. Goes, goes into the charter, understanding exactly what it is the governance office is going to work on so people know what to expect. Define policies, procedures, and processes. Now, this is confusing for some people. I've actually had, had people think that this means business processes and business policies, and that's not what this means. Defined policies and procedures within the data governance office are actually data governance policies, procedures, and processes. So just as everything else needs to be governed, so does data governance, which is why uh, there's usually a data governance council of some kind that oversees and, and helps us as a check, check and balance for governance itself. So governance will have a lot of policies and procedures that define how they operate, how they interact with the other functional areas, how to collect the information that they need, how they do their sign off. So these differ from the business processes that have data governance interjected into them to ensure that they are complying with data governance. Stewardship roles and responsibilities. This is extremely important because a lot of people will say, well, it's not my responsibility to, you know, collect your metadata. When I do that, I'm, I'm a, you know, I do, I'm a whatever. I, that, that's, you know, I'm Dr. Jim, not, not a player, right? So it's, this is my job. But if you look at it, a lot of times the people that you're talking to stewardship roles already. It's just not formalized or it's not defined that way. And one of the things that I found when I go into a company and, I, and I'm starting a data governance effort and um, there's some pushback and they, people say, hey, you know what, we're already overworked. Don't tell people that you have to add this onto their job because they're just going to hate it and they're already, you know, hating the fact that we're doing this. But what I try to do is find out what the person's role already is and how they're interacting with the data, whether they're, um, you know, if they're involved with the SDLC process, for example, doing development work, even as a business person, you can say things like, well, hey, um, you know, as the business person who's, who's 
um, we're seeing this development project, uh, have you given business requirements that define certain things? What define certain things? Well, you know, you, you came up with this new field. Are you telling them what that means? Well, oh, yeah, of course. You know, I'm telling them what the, the calculation has to be. I'm telling them, you know, what, how it's defined. Well, that's metadata. So you're already doing metadata. Oh, really? That's metadata? Yes, that's metadata. So now you've just educated them. Now they're using proper terminology, and they realize that it's not something new that they're being asked to do. They're being recognized for what they're already doing. So that's a key thing to helping people understand that they're being recognized for the role they're already playing. You're not asking them to do all this additional work. A stewardship committee. Now, I've already mentioned that, that the, a governance council really is made up of the higher level executives that ultimately govern what's going on with governance. So it's kind of a checks and balance. Now, I have seen governance committees and, and governance councils done a lot of different ways. I'm not going to go into those because we don't have time to, to go through all those different types of iterations here. I've seen companies that only have one committee uh, made up of uh, senior managers and directors who basically do all the deciding and all the managing, and that's all the company has. I've seen models where a company will have a, a data governance council, high-level executives, as well as a separate stewardship committee made up of managers and leads who do a lot of that work. And I've seen um, companies that have three. They've got the high-level data governance council, they've got a senior manager director um, uh, management committee that basically does a lot of the footwork for management and enforcement, and then a technical committee on top of that that actually fields the bug reports, the new requests, the, um, they handle the risk management, they hash out the definitions, and all of these groups, uh, in, in my opinion, need to be made up of both technical and business people. So regardless of the type of, of model that your company uh, uses to employ, um, the key here is that you need to include both technical and business people so that data issues can be discussed from, from all levels. Um, oh, I forgot one other model I've seen is um, smaller companies will sometimes choose to integrate the Data Governance Council into an existing executive committee. So rather than having another meeting, another agenda, it simply becomes an agenda item on an executive council um, committee. And I, I've heard sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. It depends on how busy that council already is and how much governance work needs to be done. So if that's, if you have a small enough company and there's a small enough amount of work, um, that could work. Um, you could couple that with um, a stewardship committee that, that does a lot more of, of the work. Um, that'll work uh, as well. So obviously that's a whole whole other area that we can get into a lot more discussion as well. Um, and then we've got dedicated and ongoing funding technology and staff. That That's pretty self-explanatory, so I'm not going to go into great detail on, on that one. We have defined communication plan as well as change management and training plans. These, these three areas, communication, change management, and training, I really feel strongly are, are very, very important to the success of a data governance effort. Without the communication, the, the units tend to be very siloed. Most companies don't come out as, you know, um, a $5 billion company from the get-go with everything organized and, and communicated. They start, they start small. So a lot of companies will start with a few people, and over a period of time, they grow and grow and grow and grow. Some companies grow really, really quickly, especially when a company grows very quickly. They don't have time to put in that formalization, the policies, the procedures. Uh, they, they're barely able to keep up with the, with the work that they're doing. They're hiring the minimum amount of people just to get things going. They're trying to make a profit. They're trying to do things as, as best they can. And so oftentimes, documentation, uh, goes the wayside. Um, technology often isn't, isn't brought in until they're much bigger. So there's a, there's a lot of manual things. And because functional areas tend to operate very siloed, this intercommunication between cross-functional areas tends to be one of the last things people put in place. So when data governance, actually one of the benefits of data governance 
business is going to unlock that siloed system. It forces the business units to talk to each other. Communication plan, which communications and change management is, is again, a whole other area we could spend a lot of time on. Um, there's um, the, the um, innovation, sorry, couldn't think of a term. So diffuse innovations on who to talk to, when to talk to them, how to talk to them in order to achieve effective communication um, is, is a whole science in and of itself. Understanding your people, understanding how to build a successful change management communication plan in order to achieve optimal communication can go a long way. If you talk to the wrong person at the wrong time with the wrong message, you're going to, in effect, sabotage your effort because they're going to going to be upset. They're not going to like it. They're going to go and and spread their opinion to other parts of the company, and then you're going to have a much more difficult time on your hands to get. Um, data governance off the ground. I have had several clients, matter of fact, most of my clients, um, I and, and the first thing they say is, oh, we've done data governance before. Nobody's happy with it. Everybody hates data governance. So whatever you do, don't use the words data governance and don't say change management to everybody because the first thing they'll do is, is walk away. And that's the key indicator that they have not done proper communication and change management in the past, and now everybody is uh, turned off to the terms, which makes it very difficult. I actually had one client who said, you need to create a whole new method of change management to implement without telling anybody um, that you're doing change management. And I was like, oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, you pretty much can't do change management without communication. And so that was that was a very interesting uh, interesting request. Um, and meaning as well is is very important. So um, required priorities in all projects and programs. Again, this is something that you're going to want to start out iteratively. Start out with a few things um, here and there as you build the 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 um, process and the policies. Oftentimes, what I see is IT will be involved in a series of projects. Um, and, and obviously, some are already in place, some are, are about to start. What I would usually recommend is still going back, unless it's a project that is going to have a second phase that hasn't started yet, or there's a specific need because it relates to another project that's going on. It's, it's too much work to go back and try to add hours to an existing project or or implement things, uh, you know, once everything is, is in production. So don't worry about going back unless it becomes a priority for other reasons. Start with something that is just starting at a point in time. Once your policies and procedures are in place and you've talked with the PMO and IT is on board with, with getting um, data governance infused into the SDLC, the um, System Development Lifecycle, that you want to start. And over time, as you add, you know, each existing or each, um, you know, subsequent project, over time, eventually you will be infused into all projects and programs. The resources to go back. So, Cephytrix monitoring and reporting. Again, this is specific to data governance. You, you will do, um, you'll implement a lot of metrics and monitoring for, uh, you know, various things. You, you're going to monitor um, security, who has authorization, who's been accessing certain systems. You'll have metrics for data quality. You'll have, um, you know, monitoring the progress of, of metadata efforts, et cetera. So all of these things will have their own metrics and monitoring and reporting. But you also want to do that from a data governance standpoint. Um, mostly to, to start collecting information on um, the adoption and the acceptance within the company. So if you have certain policies and procedures for, um, for DLC is one of, the, one of the simplest ones, collecting metadata, you can actually put metrics in place that monitor the, the progress of collecting metadata in, in the SDLC. And, you know, very simple metrics, they don't have to be highly complex, but it's something where you can go to executives and say, look, we have statistics showing that we are getting adoption, we are getting acceptance, people are adding to the metadata repository, we are getting these things, um, you know, we've got certified reporting, this year, you know, as of this month we have 100 certified reports. Those are, those are the kind of things that you can put, um, put numbers around.
and it also helps justify um, ROI. So once you start collecting metrics, there's ways that you can go around and actually start putting dollar signs attached to that and start uh, proving your ROI for your data governance effort, um, which is, is often challenging since most people see data governance as a, um, an overhead expense. But you want to bring it around to show that you're, you actually are saving the company money, and this is one way that you can do it. Supported compliance enforcement. <laughs> this, is a, this is a huge, huge um, area. And there's different types of enforcement uh, from manual to automated, lots of pieces and parts to this. But what you want to make sure you do is put in place some sort of compliance enforcement to make sure that all the work you're doing is actually uh, going forward. Um, and part of this is, is what I was just talking about, the acceptance and um, you know, accountability and responsibilities for stewards, et cetera. If you build a really great data governance program and nobody is using it and because there's no compliance, then you've just wasted your time. Um, I, I do actually hear from quite a few companies who say, well, we want, to, we want to do data governance, but we tell anybody that they have to use it, so we're not going to do the compliance piece. Well, you pretty much should should just not do it then because the company that tells me that the company is not at the maturity level to implement successful data governance. If if the company culture is such that, that nobody's going to pay attention to the policies and procedures you put in place, then you really should be spending your efforts doing some data quality, getting those metrics in place to have some RO, some ROI or statistics showing proof that you have data quality issues that you need data governance in order to help ensure the quality of your data. Um, so that's that. Um, part of company culture seen as business as usual. This I was talking about earlier. If um, data governance is not part of your com company culture, it has to be built into your company culture and needs to be seen as business as usual. Like I was saying earlier, build it into the existing policy Every, com every, every department has existing procedures, whether they, they even realize it. I do process improvement work, I go in and I don't just say, okay, okay we're going to do. Um, here's your process, here's how we're going to fix it, blah, blah, blah. What I usually do is I talk with the, the stakeholders and say, okay, what is your process? They say, okay, we do this, we do this, we do this, here's our process. Then I go and I talk with people. And okay, what is the process? Then I go back to the stakeholders and I say, here's what you said the process is, and here's what your people say the process is, and here's the delta. There's there's a big difference. And then we develop what the process should be. We re-engineer it, we do the improvement, and I say, okay, now we've come up with what your process is going to be. And then ultimately at the end of the, the, the there's a final that says, okay, here's what was implemented. So usually four sets of flow charts I do um, for clients when I do process improvement work. But um, the key here is every has processes, whether they're formalized or not. Um, and once you start flow charting that out and adding some of those controls for governance in there, it just becomes a process improvement effort. It's not, here's all the data governance you now have to do. It's oh, you have a process that's really redundant and takes this person three hours. We can re-engineer this, throw a couple of data governance thing in here, and now it only takes the person two hours, and it's more efficient, and the person downstream gets the report they need it to be. So there's a lot of, uh, a lot of interdependencies and interrelatedness there. Asked is data accepted company-wide as a strategic asset. This, this is something that... Um, Ash lot to it too. <laughs> as, as a strategic asset is, if anybody has embraced this, they will have that as part of the company vision. It will be within the company charter, be at the company level, and all of the units across the company will have within their processes data governance, data quality, whatever it is that that, that relates to their group. So I go into a company and they say, oh yeah, we we embrace it as an asset and it's part of our mission, then half your battle is already done because you know you have um, executive support. You know that people have been educated on what data is and data governance, hopefully, um, and you've got a starting ground. If you go into a company and there's no 
data, data as, as an asset, they don't even know what that means, then you really have to start from ground zero. So that's a key indicator for me. But ultimately, if you get to the point where it's part of your company culture, data, um, data governance processes are business as usual, and the company understands data as a strategic asset, then that's ultimately where you want to get your, um, your company to. With that, I am going to uh, turn it over to Shannon for questions for the remaining 15 minutes that we have left. All right, and we definitely have questions coming in. And of course, one of the most popular questions that we always get are questions about the slides. Uh, just to let everybody know, we will be sending out an email, or I will be sending out an email by end of day Thursday with links to the slides and the links to the recording of this presentation. Uh, so today, uh, what are the critical data governance tasks and deliverables that should be in the SDLC? Let's see, that's a, that's a really good one. So a couple of the foundational pieces, what I consider foundational pieces, have to do with data quality and metadata. And sometimes data security is pulled in there too because you've got um, authentication and access and, and those kinds of rights. What I would... Um, Want to try to identify those within your own company is take a look at your business requirements, your requirements and data requirements. If you've got business requirements that say, um, you know, we have to be able to track whether or not um, the quality of the data is is matching what we need for X Y Z, then you know that data governance, data quality, excuse me, is going to be an important um, an important facet. So what you'll want to do is build into the SDLC process checks and balance to ensure that not only is data quality being done throughout the, the product, but also will continue to be monitored and reported on after the fact. So as far as a deliverable goes, you'll want to do things like collecting metadata, and you need to, within the data requirements and business requirements, define what those are. You know, we just want um, definitions. Do we also want precision formatting? Um, you know, the other pieces and parts that go along with metadata. Um, so there's a whole, whole bunch of things. So it really depends on your company and what you want to collect. Um, sign-offs are, are a big thing. You want to make sure you have sign-offs within the SDLC. So you're going to have, for example, um, bigger companies that actually have a data quality department and a metadata department and a data governance department will have sign-offs from all of them. Uh, you know, metadata will have to be signed off by your metadata person. If you're a smaller company and your SDLC uh, team only includes one uh, <laughs> poor data quality person who has to do everything, that that person would need to sign off that, yes, we have the metadata, yes, we have the data quality metrics, yes, I've done source to target validation, yes, our data governance uh, processes have been, um, you know, adhered to. And data governance will look at that project and say, has the data quality person signed off? If the data quality person is signed off and data governance says, oh, yes, signed off, we're good from a data quality standpoint. The soft are really, 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 really big. Another big one would be SLAs for collecting data and managing data. Um, and I won't get into all of that. There's, there's a lot of other deliverables that you can look at, but, but um, sign-offs and, and SLAs, I think, are two, two big ones you want to take a look at. It's a cover DG in, in an hour. <laughs> it, it is. Well, I, and I pared this down from a, from a half-day tutorial, so <laughs> it's a lot of information. <laughs> So, uh, one of the attendees would like to know your thoughts on what the importance is of data governance after most of the data, data quality issues have been addressed and data quality rules are in place and everything is moving along. Okay, I'm going to show you the slide. Let me find the slide here real quick. I showed you earlier from um, As you can see, data governance is not just ensure data quality. Quality. It has a lot of different pieces and parts to it. Um, but data quality and data management, you've also got database operations management. You've got um, reference and master data management, data warehousing and BI management. So once your data quality has been, uh, you know, gone through the, the development process and you're in, develop, in, in um, production and you're just monitoring and, and managing existing data elements, uh, but not where governance stops, uh, and, and in fact, the governance on quality never stops. If, if you're familiar with um, Tom's uh, dirty lake analogy, 
um, that, you know, you're constantly using the lake. You're constantly using that data. If your data is 100% static, then once you get it in there and cleaned up, you're good to go. But I have, you, you know, rarely do I ever see static data um, from a company. Your, your reference data might be static. Um, some, some of your other data might, might be static, like lookup tables and code tables and things like that. But in general, data typically is not that static, which means anytime you have somebody touching your data, you have a root data quality issue. So it is an ongoing effort. But as you can see from this slide, um, security, you know, document and contact management, there's a whole lot of pieces and parts that go in. It really is a, a full-time job. Um, and just to, just to give you an idea, um, uh, Mario Ferrara was a, a keynote at DGIQ last year. He had hired me at a company to be the um, senior director of data governance and data quality. And um, at the, um, at, at his keynote, he said, no, oh, now I realize that data governance and data quality really are two full-time jobs, which I went up to him afterwards and I thanked him. I was like, yes, they really are. And you hired me to do them both at the same time. They really are two full-time jobs. And every single one of those is around this wheel are full-time jobs. They're, and they're teams, they're departments, depending on the size of your company and the number of products and services you have. So it's not something one person can do. It's not something you can do while you're doing something else. It's not um, something you do temporarily and then go back to your day job. It is, it is ongoing. You really need to put some effort into it if you're going to make sure that it's going to be successful. All right, another question here. Templates are templates of charters, policies, role, responsibilities, communication plan, et cetera, exist. We don't have a DG council yet, but have been asked to create a number of the above. We want to avoid being overwhelmed by recreating the wheel. That's a good question, yeah. Um, you know, I use my own templates. Uh, that I've created over time, and I know, like like uh, other consultants, we don't usually give that information out online. So I'm not sure how much is is actually out there now because I haven't looked in a while. But no, you know, anytime I need, um, I template for something or an idea on how I want to create something. I do a lot of research online. I usually pull pieces and parts from from what other people have done. Um, oftentimes, you'll see um, full documents and templates from academia because do post a lot of their stuff out there. Uh, templates themselves, a lot of times you'll have to pay for. Companies will put templates together and then sell them. Uh, although I don't, I don't have any off the top of my head to give you. Um, what area you could look is um, parliamentary procedure. So if you're familiar with Robert's Rules of Order for uh, parliamentary procedure, most not Nonprofits use Robert, Robert's rules for how to conduct business. A lot of times within parliamentary procedure documents, it'll say you must have a chart that says you must, you know, what is your vision, what is your whatever. And that could give you an outline of some, something you might, might want to pull from. Um, but I, yeah, sorry, I don't actually know of any, any place online where you can just go and get these kinds of templates. Although hire me, I'd be happy to work that out with you. <laughs> <laughs> we will make sure get everyone gets their, their, their tech information. <laughs> okay, so it looks like we actually have a, a, a time for one more question. Um, what is the most commonly realized value from data governance? The most commonly realized value? Mm -hmm. Wow, that's a great question. Um, I think the, the most common value that I try to help my clients see and, and what the most surprised about seeing is that by implementing the data governance, um, eventually companies see that run smoother, they have less issues with their data, their, their communication between the cross-functional areas. So in general, the cost for what they consider overhead data governance, data quality work in general actually becomes more cost effective. And most people, I think, are really surprised by that because they think of implementing data governance as being a cost to the company, and that's all it is. It's like, okay, great, we have to, we have to do regulatory compliance, so now it's going to cost us, you know, this many, whatever, million dollars. Um, but ultimately, when you start implementing this stuff, new ROI and actually show that not only does it pay 
to for itself, but you end up saving money. A uh, real, real quick example is, is metadata. I have a slide I, I do on one of my tutorials showing how much it costs the company um, to ask questions. So it, it, you can break it down to an actual dollar amount, how much it's costing a company to just have every person in the company ask one question a day, how much time it takes to get that question answered. Whereas if you had a metadata repository that people could go to and look that information up themselves, you would actually save a lot of money. And that's, that's one thing I use to help justify uh, metadata repository work. So, so ultimately, you think it's going to cost money, but it ultimately ends up saving a lot of money in addition to making the management a lot more um, efficient and effective within the company. So much, I'm afraid that is all we have to for, and I'm so glad we finally got to do a webinar together. Oh, this is great. Thank you for asking me. And like I said, I'll get the email out to everybody um, by end of day Thursday with links to the slides, links to the recording, and along with Joy's contact information. And of course, you can meet her in person at Enterprise Data World 2015 in Washington, D.C. We hope we can see you there. And thanks for everyone for your participation today. We love it, as always, with all the great questions and everyone getting involved in everything we do. Hope everyone has a great day. Thanks so much, Shannon. Thank you for your commentary.